Hey, welcome to Janktown. We're here and today we're brewing around one of the main villains from Lord of the Rings, Saruman of many colors. Specifically, black, blue, and white. Saruman is a 6 mana value 5 4 avatar wizard with ward, discard an enchantment, instant, or sorcery. So, off the bat, he already protects himself and he's pretty hard to remove. And then, whenever we cast our second spell each turn, each opponent mills two. We then exile any enchantment, instant, or sorcery from their graveyard, but only if it has equal or lesser mana value than our second spell. We copy the exiled card and we can then cast that without paying its mana cost. Quite a mouthful and a pretty complex ability, so there's a lot of things to unpack here. But before we get into it, if you'd like to support the channel, right now there's only one way to do it. Uh, just hit the like, share, and subscribe. All those things really help the channel out. Saruman is really unique. There were many ways that we could go about doing this. I actually took a, took a, took a bit of time to brew this deck. You know, I identify as Mono Black, Demir, and Esper. Not to say I don't play the other colors, but these are just, I guess, my home colors. When the set came out, this was the only Esper Commander that they released. So naturally, my brain started trolling me on how I should be building this. Oh. Right. So buckle in, because this commander analysis is going to be a pretty long one. First off, keep in mind that he costs 6. That means without fast mana, we're typically getting him out turn 5, maybe turn 4 at best. Turn 6 at worst, hopefully. So early turns, we're going to need the setup. Setup, setup. It's absolutely important for us to consistently hit our land drops in this deck. Secondly, that ability reads really cool. It sounds really fun because we get to play with our opponent stuff, beat them with it. But I think it's actually potentially distracting, especially if that's all our deck is trying to do. You know, maybe, maybe Saruman is the one trolling us. But the reason I say this is because a typical deck runs about 25 to 30 creatures, maybe 30 to 40 lands, throw in around 10 more artifacts. So in terms of card pool, if you put that all together, we're probably only gonna have access to about 25% of our opponent's decks. Now granted, we do have three opponents, which means the chances of us milling into something really nice goes higher. But then we need to ask ourselves, well, what kind of instants and sorceries would they be playing anyway? I think typically we'll run into ramp spells, draw spells, uh, removal spells, stuff like wipes, targeted removal, bounce, maybe theft. People like to run protection spells, stuff that grant indestructible for their board or protection for something. They like recursion spells, overrun or some type of anthem effect, uh, or maybe something completely janky but totally synergistic in their deck, which makes it hard for us to take advantage of. When we're playing out our second spell, the odds of us getting a haymaker, like maybe an insurrection or a time warp, is probably really small. Unless, of course, that's really what their deck is all about. In which case, you done messed up, A.A. Ron! <laughs> yeah, anyway, odds are, all we'll really be able to do with our second spell is maybe ramp into a land. Or maybe draw two cards. Still good, but when put that way, it sounds a lot less exciting. Now, admittedly, enchantments are a wild card. And maybe we're going up against players with high budget. So we could steal out a Rhystic Study or a Smothering Tithe. You know, that'd be the dream. But outside of Enchantress decks, enchantments are some of the least played card types. After Planeswalkers and Battles, of course. Plus again, we might run into something totally synergistic with their deck, but totally janky when it comes to us. So it's gonna be hard to benefit off of that. Another thing to keep in mind is that the typical curve of decks is around 3 to 4. Maybe below 3 if we're running into some aggro, but what this means is that the typical cards that we're gonna be hitting probably costs around 4. Occasionally, I know we'll hit the 5 drop, the 6 drop, maybe something higher, but it also means for us that if we run out a 4 drop for our second spell, it's probably gonna be good enough. All that said, I'm not hitting on this card, right? We get some really nice value on top of whatever second spell that we're gonna be playing. And so that's why we're not gonna be playing this like some random Esper commander. We're still playing Saruman. Being able to trigger his ability and do it effectively is something that we're still gonna be wanting to do. It does only trigger once per turn, thanks to the whole second spell clause, but if we're able to get it off a few times, it should still get us a lot of value, which is something that we can hopefully snowball into. However, just relying on stealing things, I think that's gonna be really tough. So the deck will run well on its own, but the extra value from Saruman is probably gonna be the thing that will put us over the top. I'll take you through the deck's seven different themes and the card choices for each one, but full disclosure right now, this is not gonna be a budget deck. However, all that said, I will be putting substitutes just in case you guys don't wanna shell out all that money and they won't be perfect but hopefully they'll be close enough. So our seven themes will consist of ramp, removal, and draw, our usuals, but then I'll cover other themes of wheels, payoffs, cheat, and something we like to call UVP or utilities, bombs, and pets. 
Now starting with ramp, even if it's not the most exciting, but having enough mana is gonna be essential for executing our game plan. Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, the two blue talismans, plus a Demir Signet are all great two drops. And our deck heavily features blue, and so that's why I'm biased towards these cards. We are hoping to really jump ahead though, and Thran Dynamo and Gilded Lotus are artifacts that give us this huge boost of mana. We can go from like turn 4 to suddenly turn 8, and since Saruman costs 6, I think it still falls under the curve. Beyond traditional ramp though, we are playing some cost reducers as well. Dream Devourer lets us foretell any card in our hand, essentially banking it in exile and letting us play it for 2 less at a later turn. This is good when we run our wheels, because then we get to save whatever card we don't want to wheel away as we draw a new grip. Helm of Awakening is a 2-drop that reduces all spells of all players by 1. We're not spell slinger. our deck has actually a pretty good spread of card types, and that's why I didn't go for the instants and sorceries cost 1 less to cast type of things. I'll take the versatility over making it asymmetrical. Thrix is a 5-drop that reduces our big spells, and plus makes them uncounterable. I actually value both clauses on this one. One, because we are running big spells, meaning the mana reduction might come in clutch. And two, it would suck to just get countered. Finally, Rituals. Dark Ritual and High Tide are classics, but Energy Tap is a card that I don't see much play. We won't be attacking too much, so tapping down a creature like Saruman will get us a big burst of 6 colorless mana, which we can then filter into another spell. We also run Dramatic Reversal, and so while the Isochron Scepter Infinite is not going to be in this deck, you can always put it in if you want, but just being able to untap our mana rocks could net us some good mana, or also some of the creatures we're hoping to activate with like tap type F activated abilities. Esper is admittedly the best defensive color, but I kind of moved away from all the removal in favor of being more proactive, so this is going to be a light list. And hey, we might even be able to play our opponent's removal spells. Snuff Out and Submerge are a pair of targeted removal with mana value 4 and 5, but we'll likely be able to play them for free. And these things work really well with Saruman, because Saruman cares about the mana value of the spells we cost, not how much mana we sink into them. So if we tap out to cast Saruman, then follow it up with something like Submerge, we can then play a 5 drop for free from our opponent's yard. Massacre is also likely a free spell, and this is a wipe that works well against decks that like to go wide with small tokens. While Baleful Mastery is a card that exiles a creature or planeswalker, which we can play for 2, but it has a mana value of 4. Leyline Binding is a 6 drop, but since we're in 3 colors, we'll likely be able to play it for just 3. Yeah, I know we're not on full domain, so we don't get the full like 5 mana value discount, but paying 3 for this type of effect is about the normal rate. And having that extra kicker of it being 6 mana value gives it more value in this deck. Lastly, Snap. It's a 2 mana bounce creature, but we get the mana back because it untaps 2 lands. This is great for being the first spell of a turn, and it sets up the second spell really well. This deck is built around building card advantage, and so draw is gonna be one of the core and central themes of our deck. Frantic Search is a 3-drop that loots for 2, and much like Snap, is a good setup for our second spell because we get to untap 3 lands. Our second spell can then be a card like Muldrifter, a 5-drop that we can invoke for 3, casting it, uh, which then draws us 2. Dig Through Time is an 8-drop that we can cast for as low as 2 if we delve enough cards away. It digs 7 deep, and we get to put the 2 we need into our hand. And both of these cards work really well as second spell payoffs because again, their mana value is much higher versus what we have to pay to actually cast them. But while these are great gimmick cards, we actually need some reliable card draw too. Secret Rendezvous and Painful Truths let us draw 3 for 3, and that's some of the best rates in the game. Rona, Herald of Invasion, is a 2-drop that lets us loot, and if we flip her, we can cast something for free from our opponent's hand. Will that be a good spell? Nobody knows because we have to do it at random. But if there isn't much going on or we're just using her to block, it is a good way to get a second spell out there. Jacob Hawken is also a 2-drop that draws us a card, and in the late game, we can flip him for 6, which can then help us play free spells. Now he does exile, which means we probably don't want to load him up with bombs early on when we're still far away from the 6 flip. And I'll go on record to say that, you know, I've never flipped this dude. <laughs> he always dies, or, or the game always ends. But just getting the steady card draw, I think, for a 2-drop is good enough. You can just think of the exile thing as honestly looting something away. Other draw engines in this deck is a card like Mystic Remora. It's a 1-drop that lets us draw a lot of cards over the course of a game. And we shouldn't fall in love with the cumulative upkeep of this. If we've drawn 2 or 3, I think it's done its job. Now, alternatively, there have been times where people don't want to feed the fish. I think that's also fine. It means we've slowed the game down for a turn or two. Sometimes time is the only thing this deck needs. Fairy Mastermind is a solid 2-drop that rides along other players' draw spells. And similarly, the Council of Four is a beefy 0-8. People forget how big this guy is. It draws us a card anytime any player draws their second card. Remember, that includes ourselves. So if we draw two cards, 
we're getting a third card from the council. Jingataxus is a five drop bomb. And before we even talk about the flip side of it, I know that's the people's top of mind when they think about this card. This thing draws us a card whenever we cast a non-creature spell with mana value three or greater. That fits really well with this deck because this deck is kind of like that friend you hate splitting the bill with. You know, they always underpay. And that's what this deck is really trying to do. We try to cast big spells without having to pay for their proper mana cost. Now, if we do get to flip it, it's a bomb. We draw a ton of cards, we then bounce the board, and after we get to go on a shopping spree, a casting spree. Rounding out our draw package is a trio of cards, the first two of which are Brainstorm and Brainstone. They read similarly, and they're good for planning ahead, but they're also good for tucking away cards, especially for about to wheel. Last is Sensei's Divining Top. Now, full disclosure, we are running a combo with Top, but outside of that, it's really just great to look ahead, figure out what we want to do, because sequencing matters so much in this deck. Now, if this is outside your budget, that's understandable, we can run Scroll Wrap as a substitute. Sure, we give up the infinite, but we also get to save our wallet, so not such a bad trade. Now, if Scroll Rack is still too expensive, we can look at a card like Dream Cache. It draws three, it tucks away two, so you know it gets the job done. Bottom line is, sequencing matters. And so we need to plan ahead, and cards like this help us do that. Speaking of card advantage, wheels kick it into high gear. Windfall is the poster boy for wheels, but Jace's Archivist is a creature that has Windfall as its activated ability. Whispering Madness is a 4-drop wheel, and the Cypher is… Eh, maybe something we'll be able to do, but fortunately we don't have to rely on it. Dark Deal is a black wheel that actually gives us card disadvantage, so not super ideal. But beyond just drawing and refilling our hand, wheels are good for filling up our opponent's graveyards. Now, because we run so many draw effects, it is possible to chain ourselves out of control, and just deck ourselves. Echo of Eons and Game Plan are a couple of wheels that will reshuffle everybody's graveyards back into their library. The flashback of Echo of Eons is less than its mana value of 6, and Game Plan might be something our opponents would wanna help us pay for, especially if somebody has some type of removal in their graveyard, and they're facing down some threat from our opponents that they just need Saruman's help to get rid of. Now, if Echo of Eons is out of your budget, there are a bunch of other blue wheels that also shuffle graveyards back in. Something like Time Reversal. Sure, we lose the flashback option, but you know, it's hard to flashback money. With all that hard work, it's time for payoffs. Psychosis Crawler deals damage to each opponent when we draw a card, and Keiza is the targeted version of that. I've seen many people forget that Keiza actually targets, they think it's a bigger threat than it actually is, or maybe they have put their hopes and dreams on something that can't kill the table. So just keep that in mind, we're just so used to Nekasar effects that we forget that this can target, or rather that this has to target. Now a card I absolutely love and would one day like to do a video of is Starscream. It costs less than its mana value of 4, probably gonna be played for 3, and it brings the Monarch into play. I think the Monarch is just a great mechanic. The backside is this hasty creature that's really difficult to block thanks to Flying and Menace, and when we flip it to its front side, having a player lose 2 life per card draw can be the absolute death sentence of somebody. Another card with a similar effect is Shieldred the Apocalypse. Now this card is insane, and you probably already knew that, because it gets us back to healthy life totals when we draw cards, but it also punishes opponents for drawing spells. Now, granted, it's also very punishing to our wallet. So if you don't own this or you don't want to invest in this, we can always run a card like Fate Unraveler. It's a good substitute, it's still a 4-drop, and it still deals damage when our opponents draw their cards. Outside of inducing life loss, we can also create bodies. The Watcher in the Water is an undercosted 9-9, and it lets us a 1-1 for every card that we draw on our opponent's turn. Elinda and Azor lets us pay 4 life every end step, and we create 1-1 one, one life linkers based on the cards we've drawn for that turn. Last couple of cards in this list, Sepulchral Primordial and Breach the Multiverse, they're just a pair of 7-drop haymakers that can reanimate creatures from the yard. That's something that Saruman can't do. Breach is also good because we get one of our creatures back, just in case somebody kills our Psychosis Crawler or Shieldred. Now typically, haymakers cost a lot of mana, and they make it hard to get 2 spells out in one turn. That is of course, unless we cheat. As Foretold is a 3-drop enchantment, and it lets us cast spells for free, and while it's good to get this down early, even just having a few counters on this is actually going to be good enough for us. We can use this to pay for something cheap as our first spell, and then use our actual mana to pay for something expensive 
to be our second spell payoff. The expensive counterpart is one with the multiverse, an 8 drop that lets us cheat something from our hand or from top of our library, and if we can ritual this out early, even better. But even as a first or a second spell, I think this is always bonkers. Marshland Bloodcaster and Omnispell Adept are a pair of creatures that let us cheat on mana value costs, and they have their own quirks. The Omnispell Adept costs 3 to activate, and we can play out any instant or sorcery at instant speed. Yes, because it's attached to the Omnispell Adept's ability, we can cheat on the sorcery timing restrictions. And the Bloodcaster's activation is only for 2 mana, and it lets us play any spell for free from our hand with the additional cost of paying life. Now speaking of paying life, here comes the second part of our combo, Bolas's Citadel. When this hits the board, we're likely gonna be arch enemy. This chains into spells like crazy though, and cards like Brainstone and Brainstorm, these can then set us up into doing even crazier things. Last in the cheaty spells are a pair of burst cheats. One-time cheats, if you will. Aminatu's Augury puts a land into play and then lets us cast one card of each card type from among the top eight cards of our library. And Diluvian Primordial is a seven drop that lets us cast one instant or sorcery from each opponent's graveyard. These work as our second spell because they have high mana value on their own. But even as a first spell, they do let us cast other things for free, which then allows us to freely trigger our commander. UBP time! We've seen the Citadel, we've seen the top, so I guess it comes as no surprise, Aetherflux Reservoir. This is the third piece of our combo. With top and Citadel, we have near infinite draw and near infinite storm. Not that this matters so much. But what essentially what we do is we tap the top to draw a card and we put it back on top. Citadel allows us to play the top for one life and we can rinse and repeat drawing us a lot of cards. Now because of Aetherflux seeing us cast the spell, we gain a life, well actually more and more life each and every time. We just need to do that over and over again, I think about 17 times to gain 150 life for the turn. With 150 life, we activate Aetherflux thrice, boom boom boom, shoot the table down. So this means that the requirement are these three cards plus about 18 cards in our library might not be the hardest thing to pull off. But even without the combo, our deck likes to chain spells together. In which case, the incidental life gain might actually be pretty relevant, especially if we're eating aggro early. Another win con in the deck is Approach of the Second Sun. We get through our deck pretty quickly with wheels, draw spells, things like this. So recasting it 7th from the top might not actually be that hard. You might even be able to cast it for free. Now if you don't like having win the game cards, I, I know some players don't, we can always run Teferi Temporal Pilgrim. It's a 5 drop planeswalker that draws a card, sure. But the ultimate here is actually within reach because we add a loyalty counter whenever we draw a card. That means with one wheel, we can get this guy from 4 loyalty up to 11 immediately. Now let's say that's our second spell for the turn and we're able to cast some type of draw 2 spell from our opponent. Now he's at 13. His ultimate is the most painful kind of board wipe because it tucks everything away. There's no recursion from that. Win cons aside, I recommend running Ley Line of Anticipation. If we're lucky, starts in play. But even if we're not, having flash is great because we can wait out removal spells or we can cast creatures with activated abilities at pseudo haste or it even lets us play back-to-back -back haymakers doing it at someone's end step and then doing a bunch of stuff on our turn. It's just so versatile and it really opens up the possibilities in the deck. Staying on the flash theme, Heliod the Radiant Dawn. The enchantment recursion is actually pretty relevant in case we want to get our Mystic Remora or one with the multiverse back but the flip side gives our spells flash which we already talked about is pretty great. Our wheels can now come in at instant speed. And given its ability, it can unlock a huge mana reduction bonus for us, allowing us to chain huge haymakers ahead of the curve. Last few spells, Propaganda is just a great card and it keeps our face safe from huge attacks. And this continuity, well, fine, this is just jank. We can end the turn for 6, making it like the ultimate counter spell. We can stop combat, we can exile spells on the stack, we stop abilities and all triggers from happening, or you can just end our turn for two, which we'll probably be doing a lot of the time. If this is our second spell, it goes on the stack, and then Saruman sees it as our second spell, so his ability goes on top of it. That resolves, we then do the whole mill, exile, and then cast something for free. When we cast something for free, that goes on top of it. That resolves. Finally, discontinuity resolves ending the turn. So it's just value, but it's also a really fun card. Nobody expects this and nobody plays around this. Finally, this is a Saruman deck, and so that means we gotta play Storm of Saruman. It's in the name. Our second spells become even deadlier because we get two copies of it. So have fun with your double Breach the Multiverse or two copies of Diluvian Primordial. And that's it for this episode. If you made it this far, thank you so much for sitting through. I know that was a long episode. I really put a lot of effort into this and I hope it shows. There were just so many directions to brew this commander and I think that speaks to just really cool design. Again, if you'd like to support the channel, just hit the like, share, and subscribe down below. It really helps us out. 
And until next time, stay inspired, friends, and I'll see you soon.